Welcome to 1000 PS TV. Today we've got a really exciting topic, the K5 engine from Suzuki. Martin Bauer is with me today, the Grandmaster of Speed and all things technical. The K5 engine from Suzuki keeps coming up again and again because it's still being used in a number of brilliant models today. In total it's been built 200,000 times so far. That's absolutely incredible for a one liter superbike engine. And those 200,000 units have all gone into bikes. You'll find it in the Suzuki GSX S1000, the GSX S1000 GT, the GSX S1000 GX and the Suzuki Katana which, in my opinion, unfortunately, never really took off. The other models are selling much better, while the Katana tends to be a bit neglected. But personally, I think it's absolutely fantastic. This K5 engine is just amazing. I think it originally came out around 2006 or so with the GSX-R1000. And back then there was already a crazy amount of development that went into it. So I'm really glad you're here, Martin, to help us understand it. What's still the same in that engine compared to when it first launched in the GSX-R1000? Just to go back into the history a bit, uh, back then Suzuki managed to combine really high peak power with loads of torque in this K5 engine. And to this day that combination is still pretty much unmatched. These days, everything's shifting more and more towards peak horsepower and the focus on torque is slowly being left behind, which is actually a drawback, especially for bikes that are mainly ridden on the road. We've now got well over 200 horsepower, more than enough peak power for road use. But what's missing across the board is a bit of torque. And that's exactly where this engine stands out. Even back then, they managed to combine a high peak output. We're talking 178 horsepower with 118 Newton meters of torque. And that's the kind of performance that still makes this engine so interesting today, particularly for road bikes. It has evolved a bit since those days, of course, but the core foundation has remained largely the same. I remember how Suzuki launched the very first GSX-R1000 that was with the K2 engine. It already had 160 horsepower, which was about 10 more than its closest rivals at the time and roughly 20 more than most other bikes. And even that early version delivered a strong punch of torque. For me, the K5 engine was clearly a further development of that original concept. More power, more refinement just a better overall package. But the reason people don't refer to it as the K2 engine is because the K5 marked such a significant step forward in terms of both design and performance. It wasn't just a small update, it was a major rework. And even back then it already had loads of torque. For me the K5 engine was a clear evolution of that. But then why don't people just call it the K2 engine? Because in that generation leading up to the K5 engine, there were a lot of innovations that massively increased peak power from those 160 horsepower up to 178. A lot of components were new. For example, this engine already had full titanium valves, which gave it a further boost. They managed to keep the torque curve that the earlier generation of one liter engines had, while at the same time increasing peak power. So without sacrificing torque, they were able to push the top end further thanks to these upgrades. For instance, compared to the first engine, they also enlarged the balancing force between the cylinders. In a running engine, you always have two pistons moving upwards and the two outer ones moving downwards. That means there's constant overpressure and underpressure underneath the pistons. And those balancing bores between the cylinders make sure that this overpressure and underpressure is balanced out from one side to the other. If you didn't do that, it would obviously lead to losses because the pressure would always be pushing against the piston, whether it's going up or down. So they significantly enlarge those bores to minimize those losses. 
especially at high revs where it really affects performance. And with these kinds of modifications, the uh, titanium valves and so on, they manage to significantly increase power at the top end without losing any torque. So basically you've got almost the same power curve up to the mid range. And then at the top, it just lifts by 15 to 20 horsepower compared to the previous version. And that's why this became the base engine. And it's remained more or less the same all the way to today, because you could say that even in today's engines, it still offers one of the best combinations of strong, low end torque and high peak power. And it also had a lot of potential for racing at the time, especially when it came to squeezing out more peak power. The K5 engine's original setup was quite conservative. That means the cam timing was relatively mild, which gave good torque, but also left plenty of room for tuners. Yoshimura, for example, always had kit options with more aggressive cam profiles, longer durations, and that allowed you to gain quite a bit more top end power for racing. Even the compression ratio was still pretty tame at 12, 5 and very manageable. So you could also increase compression a bit by skimming the cylinder head or using thinner head gaskets and get a few more horsepower out of that too. So all in all, this engine wasn't just great for road use, it was also a dream for tuners at the time, because with just a few relatively simple modifications, you could unlock a lot more performance. Martin, that's extremely interesting. So basically this K5 engine really had quite a long active life, even in racing, right? From my perspective as a journalist, I was always being fed press releases and updates, you know, things like reduced internal friction or redesigned intake ports. There was always something being said, but I couldn't really verify or disprove any of it. Because let's be honest, even if I opened up the engine, I wouldn't really see anything in there. That's just the truth. But I could always feel the engine fairly well, and you could tell when something had genuinely changed. The thing is, over those two-year cycles, the differences often became so minimal that you'd really only notice the big jumps. But you, you know exactly what they've been doing over the years, every two years. So what do they actually do to make the engine two horsepower stronger? What exactly is being changed there? Well, over those years leading up to the complete overhaul of the base engine, which I think happened in 2017 or 2018, they worked on small detail improvements, just like the ones you mentioned. Uh, the main focus was uh, gradually reducing the various losses uh, that naturally occur in an engine. Uh, primarily, that means friction losses, like you said. Uh, they worked on that by using specific coatings so on the pistons, in the bearings, even on the piston rings to reduce friction in all those areas. It's all about squeezing out a bit more performance in the small details. And really during those years, it was mainly these kinds of modifications. They also worked on optimizing flow characteristics. A lot of development went into the exhaust side, especially the exhaust and emission systems. Uh, fuel injection also kept improving. They started using injectors with more spray holes, which gave better atomization, for example. But eventually there came a point when things really kicked off in terms of pushing peak horsepower. BMW was one of the first to break into the 200 horsepower range and that basically forced all the Japanese manufacturers to follow suit. Up until that point, all the one liter engines, regardless of which Japanese brand we're talking about, had a pretty similar layout in terms of bore and stroke. There wasn't a huge difference between them. They aimed to have a strong base torque and a certain ref ceiling, so they perform well both on the road and the racetrack. A good balance of both, but when BMW made that move, the Japanese had no choice but to chase peak performance. Because at the end of the day, the spec sheet says how much peak power the engine makes. And as you well know, that's how bikes are judged. That was the point when the Japanese manufacturers also started changing their basic engine layouts in favor of higher peak performance. 
And that's really where you reach a fork in the road, where you can't cover the full range anymore. As an engine developer, you have to specialize and say, right, peak horsepower is now the priority, so how do we get there? And you just can't achieve that anymore with the kind of layout Suzuki had in the K5 engine, where they used relatively small pistons combined with a long stroke. And how do you get that long stroke? By placing the crank pin far out from the center of the crankshaft's rotation. That gives you more leverage and more torque on the crankshaft because you've got a better lever arm. But the downside to that system is that this longer lever also results in a longer stroke, which in turn leads to much higher piston speeds because at the same engine speed, a piston with a longer stroke has to travel much faster up and down than one with a shorter stroke. That means you're limited in terms of maximum RPM before the whole thing blows apart. And that's why manufacturers eventually changed course completely and redesigned the layout, increasing the piston diameter and reducing the stroke. And that was the starting point for building engines aimed at higher RPM and higher peak power. Suzuki followed the same path from the 2017 model onwards. They also reduced the stroke and increased the piston diameter to be able to keep up in terms of peak performance. But as we also saw with the other brands, that came at the cost of losing some potential in the lower ref range. Let me quickly jump in here, Martin, because something just clicked for me. I now really get why this K5 engine is being used in street bikes rather than the newer version with the shorter stroke. That's now super clear because on the road, you actually need that low end torque. There's no point having some absurd peak power figure if there's nothing happening down low so that makes total sense now but what i've never really understood and not just in this case but in general is this quite often the japanese superbike engines end up being used in naked bikes and it's always said that they've been tuned for more torque and in return they make 20 horsepower less but here's the thing this k5 engine in the way it's used now puts out 152 horsepower, but back in 2007, it was already doing roughly 178 horsepower. So why do they do that? So first and foremost, with these super bike derived engines, the aim on the road is exactly what we talked about, shifting things a bit in the direction of better torque delivery. And the main way to do that is by changing the cam timing. The longer the cam duration, the more peak power the engine can produce but that comes at the expense of performance in the lower rev range. That's why in these engines, they usually used valve timing or camshaft profiles, thanks for the correction, that were a bit milder and more torque focused. That meant sacrificing a bit of top end power, but gaining more punch at the bottom. That was always the standard approach from the Japanese manufacturers to make the bikes more usable and responsive on the street. Now, with the Suzuki engine, that kind of detuning wasn't even really necessary because it already had great low-end performance. But many of the other manufacturers had to go that route just to improve rideability and bottom-end grunt for real-world riding. Martin, thank you so much for all your insight. I've honestly learned a ton. I can now understand everything much more clearly. And the Suzuki K5 engine, I finally get why it's still being used in these models. And when I write something like that myself, man, you'd think I was mad, but I get goosebumps every single time. It's still such an unbelievably awesome engine with that unmistakable Suzuki sound. Absolutely wild. And what's really brilliant, which I guess is down to the long stroke layout, is that I can ride it super lazily in the lower revs without having to shift all the time. But when I open it up, mate, it absolutely rips. Exactly, that's it. This combination is still pretty rare today. Having 118 Newton meters of torque already just above 8,000 RPM is something hardly any other engine has matched. It gives you that strong mid-range punch while still pulling hard up top. And that's what makes the K5 so special. 
Brilliant, Martin, a huge thank you from me. Folks, I hope you found it interesting. If there's anything else you'd like to know, just drop it in the comments below. And if it's something really technical, well, Martin, that one's going to be for you to answer. Otherwise, stick with us. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Give us a thumbs up. That would be absolutely fantastic. Take care. See you soon. Cheers and goodbye.